Hello, dear ones. This is uh, the last time I shall be addressing you directly, I'm sorry to say. Uh, your, your presence has been very palpable for me here in my room overlooking sunshine and trees um, where we are fortunate enough to have uh, zero infection here upstate. God willing, you'll be in the same state and the same condition in a similar place or somewhere quite far away, but still far from infection, which is what I wish you. So uh, I want to conclude by reference to a larger poetic issue, um, by reference to uh, the poet that I would urge you to join me in uh, experiencing as our national poet, uh, the, the national poet of America. This is not a contest for a greatness of poetry. If it was, I think um, I, I would find it very difficult not to give the palm to Emily Dickinson, uh, that, that great poet. But uh, for me, it inescapably is Walt Whitman who speaks of America, uh, even when he's not uh, speaking of America. <laughs> and speaks for America in so many remarkable ways uh, that I cannot think of him as anything other than our national poet. It's a wonderful thing to have a national poet. I, I, I feel um, uh, people who come from countries like, like Poland, where there is a national poet, uh, their sense of identity, their sense of common identity, their sense of community is raised to a, an entirely new level by being able to quote uh, the national poet, or think of the national poet, and think of what a national poet is, somebody who's speaking, whose utterance, whose words vibrate with the essence of, uh, the, of the nation, of, of the things that bind a, a community. So, uh, Walt Whitman, who uh, is uh, uh, certainly uh, is somebody who talks a great deal about uh, his own life uh, in many ways, in, in sexual ways, in gender ways, and who uh, uh, was, we, we, we take it gay, uh, though maybe his sense of gender extended more broadly, you, you often feel uh, in his writings, as you feel with Shakespeare, um, that uh, to uh, he had a passion uh, for we know at least one uh, beautiful young man and why why shouldn't he and why not um, and uh, it, it alarms some people to think of Shakespeare as gay even as we see quite evidently from uh, the sonnets that direct uh, a connection to Shakespeare's uh, deepest private life we know that he was uh, uh, utterly bound to surrendered to he he was he was inescapably uh, uh controlled by a passion for a lady who we know only uh, because of her darkness whether she was just simply black haired or whether in fact uh, she was a, a a woman of color which is totally possible that there was there, there were there were quite a number of black people in the london of the time uh, what we call uh, black people. So she is known as the dark lady. We don't know who she is, although there are many candidates, but nobody's in any doubt that she was a lady uh, and that he introduced her to his beloved young man and that they then had an affair, which which is the most uh, torturous event, uh, as far as we can see, of Shakespeare's life, of which he writes in agony, um, as well he might. So uh, it, it, it does occur to at least this reader uh, that to be uh, an, an outsider in the way uh, that a gay uh, person is, in the way that homosexuality obliges you to experience, is also a way into the center. By being an outsider, you know where and what the center is. If you are uh, as I have been all, all my life, um, uh, uh, boringly uh, heterosexual, <laughs> I don't think you know where the center is. To the extent that it's located in you, you can't observe and experience it. But gay people understand it both more fully, uh, more fully from the outside, 
uh, as well as from the inside. In one of my novels, you will find that the hero uh, has a, an exam question when he's a young man that he has to write about, which haunts him all his life. A stupid, one of those stupid questions in general knowledge um, uh, tests where the question is, who sees more of the parade? Uh, the person marching in it or the person watching it? Uh, and <laughs> I don't know where I found this question. Maybe I even invented it. But this haunts him all his life, the storyteller, of a very long, 700-page-long story called Richard's Feet. And um, it's a meditation that has been a meditation for me ever since I created that book. I started it uh, more than 50 years ago. It's, it's, it's complete now as part of a quartet of novels. But the question remains uh, in my mind uh, as a good one. Um, of course, who sees more of um, is something that has to be examined as to who maybe it, sh it should be really who knows more of the parade, the participant or the observer. Um, and, uh, and, and gay people are participants and observers, which is why so many of them uh, become artists and writers to communicate with everybody uh, from their uh, schizophrenic state of absolute knowledge and absolute exclusion. Um, so they are the perfect representatives of uh, human society in many ways, human society in its, in its universality. And I want you to consider the journey of the word I uh, from what you, where we started. I sent you uh, Taliesin's uh, Battle of the Trees, uh, where he says, I have been in a multitude of shapes before I assumed a consistent form. Uh, I have been a tear in the air. I have been the dullest of stars. I have been a word among letters. I have been a book in the origin. I have been the light of lanterns. I have been a course. I have been an eagle. I have been a coracle in the seas. I have been compliant in the banquet. I have been a drop in a shower. I have been a sword in the grasp of a hand. I have been a shield in battle. I have been a string in a harp. Disguised for nine years in water, in foam, I have been a sponge in the fire. I have been wood in the covert. So there's an extraordinary I. I'm thinking of this business of being insider and outsider. Uh, there's an I that speaks for everything, apparently, for everybody. And yet uh, it's, 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 in many ways, is a riddle uh, with the, along the lines that you get the schoolyard riddle, uh, you know, I have, I have a, um, what is it? I, I have a face but no eyes. I have um, uh, hands but no arms. What am I? What am I? I'm a clock. It's a riddle, and that I have been this, I've been that, I've been the other. Here is is indeed a riddle. It was unriddled by the great Robert Graves, uh, and it formed. Um, to form an alphabet, uh, it's a coded, it, it, it's a coded um, explanation of uh, lesson in uh, tree ogham, ogham, o g h a m is a word for language, and uh, there are many uh, secret languages in the, the ancient world, and of which this is one. Uh, but that it also communicates to us, I think, the universality. Um, in uh, there's a famous uh, poem called uh, Thunder Perfect Mind. It's a Gnostic hymn, and uh, it's ancient, uh, probably around the around the European Dark Ages, three hundred, four hundred, uh, what we used to call A.D. after after the, the life of Jesus. And many of the, the the hymns from that time start with the same formula: "I am the first and the last. I am the honoured and the scorned. I am the harlot and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter. So there are many versions of this, but it seems to me an extraordinary clearing of the way for the totality of utterance. I am all those things. And of course, many gay uh, honoured writers are, are precisely those things, the honoured and the scorned. But uh, it says, I, I am in everyone. And you consider uh, uh, 
Whitman's most famous utterance, I contain multitudes. What could be more American than that if you interpret it in the simple way of, uh, uh, of expressing uh, intrinsic diversity? We're all everybody. I, but it's I, I the, the, Whit, the Whitmanian I is uh, the most, uh, uh, for me, definitive taking possession of uh, the American possibility. Uh, and it's not the American dream because it's not at all about becoming president, <laughs> but it's, it is about the concept of the new world. I, uh, says Whitman, I contain multitudes. So when you read Brooklyn Ferry, and I'm going to be asking you to go to the video I've made of that poem. I'm afraid I wish it was a beautiful video of, uh, of a ferry cro crossing, perhaps into cut with my face, or perhaps leave my face completely out of it. Alas, the COVID has put me uh, in this position that I'm not expert enough to retrieve uh, bits of video of crossing uh, from Manhattan to Brooklyn, which is the subject of the poem, or it's the it's it's the it's the situation of the poem. But the poem is a declaration of absolute past, present, and futurity universality. Um, he sees, he recalls the past, he sees the present, he sees the future. He keeps saying, "I am you. I see you. I I know that you're re reading this, and when you're reading this, I know what you feel." And I know what you feel when you're on the ferry crossing to Brooklyn. I know what you see. That is still the same. Actually, it isn't. <laughs> because for him Manhattan was a great uh, um, mass of masts, a beautiful great porcupine uh, of, of ships. It was really a wonderful sight, we know from uh, paintings and even from early photographs, but that's all gone. Um, however, uh, there is still that journey to make, and there is still the sky and the seagulls and the water and the reflection of our faces, our heads silhouetted uh, darkly in the water, the shadows, all those things that make Whitman say, I know what you will feel. I know what you feel. You're reading me, and I know everything about this. So consider how American this is, <laughs> uh, this taking possession not just of a land, but of identity itself and of universality itself. Um, and consider the journey of the I. Uh, the crucial uh, development of this uh, occurs in the 1600s when uh, Samuel Pepys, uh, a burger of London, uh, decides to keep a diary, and a diary that includes coded uh, uh, references to erotic experiences. And from the code, by decoding it, we know who with and what exactly the sex was, uh, the sexual engagement was that they, that they uh, had. And uh, I don't think that was his motive, uh, although in itself, it too is, is a huge development. You know, I shall keep a record of what I am doing. What, is that, what was that sandwich I had for lunch? Why would, the, why would this be important? And he thought, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether he uh, philosophized about it. We don't have any evidence of that. But he definitely se sensed, I must write it all down. These doings of mine must live. And ever after, we've been fascinated by our individuality. And Herr Freud uh, increased the meaning of that and the reference of that and the importance of I. Uh, but America, the American I uh, is, is the, the, the great I of, of human history, uh, which we're at the moment in, in the business of perhaps ripping to shreds in, in our fear of the claims of universality and our fear of people who are not exactly like us. We need Whitman more than ever. We need Whitman to remind us uh, that uh, to be other is to be the same, is to define what your presence is in the great sameness and how it is that you can take possession uh, of everyone because you already are everyone and everyone is already you. This you will find in Whitman. It should be your song, the song of myself uh, that Whitman uh, uh, wrote. Um, he should be your song. He should be your vehicle for embracing uh, the whole of humanity, not just American humanity, but here we are uh, on the continent, definable as an entity, as a community. And Whitman is surely <laughs> its poet and surely our national poet. And please do 
uh, just for the sake of it, uh, it, it listen to or, or dial up my uh, reading of Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, uh, because I think you will feel the, the excitement, the electricity running through me as I recognize uh, what Whitman tells me is going to happen, that I am going to read this poem. Thank you all, uh, dear ones, for being with me so long uh, this summer. It's been a wonderful time for me, and I hope we stay in touch always. Thank you. Bye.